few people here. Uh, we haven't scared you off, which is a great thing. Uh, and I promise you I'm not going to talk through 15 minutes of the Air Quality Action Committee. Um, but out of the session last, two weeks ago now, there were some really important questions that came out. And you're, you're looking at the right areas and asking the right questions, so hopefully I'm going to try and fill in some of those blanks if I can. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Jason. Uh, I work for uh, three London boroughs as part of a shared service. Uh, those boroughs being Wandsworth, Merton and Richmond. Uh, I've been in environmental health since the dawn of time. I think probably I'm on my 30th year at the moment and I specialise in pollution for about 28 of those years. So I've been working in this area for a little, for a little bit of time. Uh, my team, I have the best team in the country, as you can see. We have awards to prove it and I'm really proud of the team. So can I have the next slide please? Really important to, to consider when we're, we're talking about air quality is not just how we control the sources, but there is a, a receptor at the other end of this. There's a human being that's actually going to be suffering from some of this toxic pollution. So don't just think about sources. You also need to think about the, the person at the end of the chain or the person that's impacted. Because sometimes you can't do anything about pollution sources or it's going to take years to deal with. So you then have to look at how you control the impact on an individual. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, sources of pollution. This is, I don't want a red card, so this is the ultra-fine dust. This is James, the dust. Can I just ask you to put the microphone a little bit? Sorry, is that better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Apologies, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is the sources of fine dust in Wandsworth. This is taken from um, a mapping exercise carried out by the GLA, and it's relatively accurate. So, as you can see, this is fine dust. This is the dust that gets into your lungs and goes into your bloodstream because the particles are so small. So the main source of them is, as you can see... Hold on a second, Jason. We just can't read the sources, you're going to go through them? I'm, I'm going to go through them, yeah. yeah. And we'll make this available to people. Uh, so the, if we look at the main sources, main sources are road transport, unsurprisingly. Uh, and then we look at domestic wood burning. We'll come on to that in a bit. So road transport is responsible for 30% of the small particles. Uh, biomass and wood burning, 18%. I think we heard that last week from Rosamond. Uh, commercial cooking, this is a strange one. We've never actually tackled this one. Interesting pollutant, that's 16%. And industrial processes uh, and domestic heating and power, about 10%. Let's go the next slide, please. Next slide. Can you tell us what commercial cooking is? That'll be uh, grills, people, barbecue grills on buildings, um, if you go to a restaurant, they've got a big charcoal grill going, and then that stuff comes straight out of the chimney and goes into the atmosphere. Michael? Sorry, I'm, sorry. Being, I'm being cheesy. What do you mean exactly by biomass? Yeah. Oh, sorry, biomass is uh, burning of wood pellets. So we recycle wood okay. and then we burn that, and it was called, it was called biomass. Uh, and it was just simply a way of saying burning wood. What was that used? Uh, it was used quite commonly. It was, it was a. There was something that was being pushed a few years back because it was a sustainable fuel, but we now know that that's not the way forward. But is it? Would it be used, you know, domestically or how? So I, I think we're gonna we're gonna run, really run out of time if we. That that no, that's, that's an example yeah. of like a question that we can ask in the in the group. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Come on to that in a bit. Um, so the next source is dust. This is the big dust. This is the dust you see from construction sites. So if somebody's cutting something, you'll see a cloud of dust. PM10 is the, the larger dust that gets caught in your throat and in your, your, your airways. So the main sources of those, again, these are all similar things. You have air transport, construction industry, not unsurprising. Uh, you have resuspension. This is the dust that's already in the environment that if you drive over it, it blows up into the air. <coughs> and then you have the same cooking, commercial. As you can see, they're the same themes. For the main sources, they're the same themes. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Nitrogen dioxide. Number two. This is a, a, an interesting pollutant. It's more or less purely man-made. It doesn't exist in the natural environment, apart from lightning strikes, I think it is. Uh, main sources of these. Road transport. Uh, domestic heating. So all the same themes are coming over and over again. Go to the next slide, please. This, is, this comes on to the back of Andrew Hagger's point about the links between air pollution and
carbon dioxide. Then the main sources, uh, domestic heating and power, how you heat your homes, transport, industrial, commercial power and construction. So if you go back to the sources, you can control one, you, you, if you control pollution, um, our air quality pollutants, you control climate change pollutants. Next slide please. Uh, this is a difficult one. Um, road transport, I'm just going to go through very quickly the con what contributes to it and how to control it. Main, main sources of pollution are combustion engines, NO2, all of the pollutants we're talking about. And the way we can control it is to either remove or reduce vehicles, or we move towards cleaner vehicles. Some of the successes we've had include the emission standards getting better. Just, I don't know if people remember the diesel, diesel gate, when people were cheating yeah. the system. Since yeah. then, there's been a push and we've seen emission standards improving. We have the GLA low emission zones. Didn't want to mention ULES <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but the low emission zone for freight vehicles have been there for a long time and it's actually proven to work, as has the ULES in central London. I know there's a lot of politics around that and the cost of living, but it is a scheme that does work. Uh, cleaner buses in London, all buses are retrofitted to Euro 6. Um, What's Euro 6? Uh, Euro 6 is standard, it's a high standard for diesel vehicles and it's the cleanest diesel you can get. Uh, we've seen um, public transport, we've got public, we live in London, public transport is really good. Uh, school streets is a successful uh, scheme. Uh, we've seen, let me come on to this this afternoon and, and one of my colleagues will cover that. In the borough if you create uh, an infrastructure that is uh, welcoming to cycling and cleaner transport then that will promote people out of their cars. So we've seen that planning new development, we can use that to restrict um, parking, we can ask service developments to have charging infrastructure, that sort of thing. So sometimes new planning, new buildings are a good thing. Areas we still need to control include buses, they should be electrified by now, it's London. Uh, car ownership, we love our cars, how do you get people out of their cars? Um, low emission neighbourhoods, these I actually support low emission neighbourhoods, but sometimes they do push traffic onto main roads which causes more congestion. So, it has to be planned very well. Home deliveries, everybody has home deliveries, everything's at the click of a button now, and uh, you imagine that multiplied millions of times. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, domestic and commercial heating. For this, we're talking about gas boilers, uh, and the controls available are move to electric, uh, ground source heat pumps low NOx boilers, so there's some things you can do about that. Some of the successes we've had, climate change agenda has really pushed up the heating part of this. And if we go back to this part here, improved insulation, if you have better insulation, you don't need to use your boiler as much. Jason, um, could you explain really, really quickly what our air and ground source heat pumps are? Yeah, these are new devices that actually extract heat from the air or heat from the ground. They're very expensive. Um, and there's a debate over how well they work. You have to have a really well insulated property for them to work, and they're very expensive. Um, this is a heat source pump. You'll see this, and it has various bits that are attached to it. Um, planning for new buildings, we can ask for all sorts of new heating devices in new buildings. So there is a benefit for using the planning agenda. Uh, and as I say, we've got new technology, which is the heat source pumps. Problematic areas include historically poorly insulated buildings. Lots of the buildings in this country are really badly insulated, therefore they have to run their boilers more. Um, insulation grants, there's still some available, but they're not sort of universal. Uh, lots of old equipment, old, boiler, old boilers exist here in the boroughs, and there's limited regulation to deal with old properties. And we've seen dramatic weather changes over the past few years, so as temperatures drop, people have to run their boilers for longer. And obviously there is a cost. All of this is very expensive. Uh, next slide, please. 
Domestic wood burning. In short, this means people burning in the fireplace or using a wood burner. So it's like a little metal box, that you, very pretty, very attractive piece of kit. Uh, and that's controlled through legislation. Uh, in the borough, we are a smoke control area. The whole borough is designated as a smoke control area. And as part of that, you're only allowed to burn certain fuel or use a certain appliance. But how do you know what people are doing in their homes? That's the tricky one. Um, we've moved away <coughs> from burning in our grates in the 1950s, but this is a new re-emerging problem. And it's only been a problem for about the past 15, 20 years. Um, we've seen recent fuel restrictions around the most polluting fuels. That's a positive move. Uh, and as I said, the appliances need to be authorised. What we have seen is the sheer volume of this equipment uh, and the increasing use of them. So even if they are compliant and you're burning the right fuels, if you have 100 properties next to each other doing the same thing, then you've got a problem. They're very fashionable. Uh, cost of living has pushed people towards solid fuel. Oh, sorry. What do you mean by solid fuel? Is that charcoal? Solid fuel is coal or wood briquettes. Um, so it's basically that, charcoal. wood or coal. Yeah. Um, reconstituted biomass pellets. Sorry? Reconstituted biomass yeah. pellets. Yeah, they're, they're just wood that's been yeah. pressed together. Yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> there is a question here about the authority having the ability to ban things and whether we can do that. We don't have, have the ability to, 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 to ban these, device, these devices. Uh, and there's a huge lobbying interest behind this. There's lots of companies that run, that sell these devices, lots of companies pushing these devices. And to be honest, if you're in a rural area, it's absolutely fine. But if you're in a terrace row of properties and every neighbour's doing the same thing, that's when you have a problem. Next slide, please. One of my favourite areas of enforcement is construction, responsible for the pollutants we see here. There is nothing um, difficult about construction, it is about housekeeping and about enforcement. Um, we now control engines in London uh, through our scheme that we operate in our team. Um, we have a London-wide code of practice for, that covers air quality as well, which construction sites should be using. And um, we can control this through planning as well. Um, and what we've seen from uh, the industry across London is there is a commitment to do something. Construction industry wasn't like it used to be 20 years ago. They actually want to do something. Uh, the difficulty is if you've got large scale construction, you're going to create a lot of problems. So we had an issue here in Nine Elms a few years back because of sheer volume of construction and we managed to deal with that through um, enforcement, working with the con constructors. Um, I think it was Maria's job at the time and made a wonderful job of it. And now they're compliant and they're in a really good place. Um, trouble is we don't have much control over smaller developments. So your neighbour up the road that's cutting your angle, grinding and things like that. Limited control. So next slide please. Did you want to cover this one? Okay. Um, so this goes back to the point where we can't control pollution. So there are certain controls that we can do. There certain things you need to consider. So. Moving away from the source of pollution, I think earlier last week talked about people walking away from main roads to get away from the pollutants. You can look at screening and barriers, so things like green screens in schools. Um, this is an important one. one. One thing that we don't do very well is talk to the people that are actually suffering from underlying illnesses about air pollution. Um, we have lots of campaigns in the borough um, to try and raise the profile. Um, and our planning is about better by design, so designing in better insulation, therefore you don't need to use as much heat. And my colleague will talk about healthy streets approach, so making the environment attractive to, to cycling and walking. Um, internal air pollution needs to talk about this. Um, people don't really seem to realise that they actually create pollution in their own homes through cooking, candles. DIY paint, and if you're a vulnerable person, then that's going to impact on you just as much as the road traffic outside. So you need to bear that in mind. Next slide, please. Someone asked me for a personal wish list. 
Um, <coughs> to my personal wish list, it's not a political wish list. Uh, so for me, I think it was, this was uh, pointed out by Rosamond, we need a new Clean Air Act. The last one was in 1993. Society's moved on a little bit since then. And we need an act that can tackle all of these little things, these pesky problems around wood burning, bonfires, commercial kitchens, <coughs> some legislative controls, which we don't really have. Better resourcing, I'm a service manager. I, I'd, I'd like to see more resourcing in the world of air quality. Um, better comms, people need to be aware of what they can do to tackle air pollution uh, and the impact on the most vulnerable. Um, stricter targets. World Health Organisation targets, UK targets, we need to have something that challenges us to push for cleaner air, but needs to be achievable and realistic. Um, better anti-idling legislation, everybody's heard about anti-idling. The legislation, we, we try to raise awareness, we go out and we do campaigns, however, the legislation is not very good. Remind us what idling is. Uh, somebody sitting in their car with their engine running for no reason whatsoever. And it happens outside schools and things like that. And there are rules about it, but they're very weak. So we end up doing campaigns and raising awareness about that, rather than actually doing something a bit more firm. Sharing best practice. Some boroughs do some wonderful work. Other boroughs don't know about it. Even nationally, there are some pieces of work that happen in London that could be transplanted anywhere in the country, and it's not. Um, and that comes back to this. All of those layers of government need to be pushing in the right direction, in the same direction. So that was my personal wish list. And I'm just going to leave you with that point here, which is about who is responsible for air pollution. And basically, it's not just government, local, regional, national. It's everything we do in our lives, from the way we heat our homes to the vehicles that we drive. So I'll leave you with that. Do you want to, do you want to read it out? <laughs> I'm out of breath here. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the poor air, that's <laughs> No, the air is here. Actually, I just... Um, we all need to act together. Businesses, citizens, group, residents and others. We need to be involved in partnership so that the strength and capacities of one actor can overcome the shortcoming and deficiency of the others, thus leading to a more resolute action for local environment. Basically, we all need to be doing our bit.